we as a human species have a common goal to protect ourselves, to protect this planet, um, and hopefully will get us starting to think more long-term. It's critical that we use COVID-19, the current pandemic, as kind of a wake-up call. We may just be one, you know, bush meat uh, meal away from the next HIV, the net one, you know, a uh, pangolin plate away from the next deadly coronavirus, or one factory farm away from the next killer flu. Hey everyone, this is Klaus from Plant Based News. I really hope you enjoyed this video, which is an interview with Dr. Michael Greger. If you get something out of this interview, you'll definitely get something out of the free summit that is linked down below that Dr. Michael Greger features in, as well as 24 other experts in the field of lifestyle medicine and conscious living. There's some more information at the end of this video, but in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the interview. Dr. Greger, thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate your time. You've got a background in infectious disease, so it's an amazing opportunity for us to be able to speak of you now, especially given the, the situation um, with, with COVID-19. One of your quotes 12 years ago is really, really powerful. It was, if you actually want to create global pandemics, he said, then build factory farms. So first question is, how do factory farms create conditions that cause um, outbreaks? Well, when we overcrowd thousands of animals, into these crowded, filthy football field sized sheds to lie beak to beak or snout to snout atop their own waist. It's just a breeding ground for disease. Why? Because the sheer numbers of animals, the overcrowding, the stress crippling their immune systems, the ammonia from the decomposing waste burning their lungs, the lack of fresh air, the lack of sunlight, put all these factors together. What you really have is kind of the perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of so-called super strains of influenza. These so-called factory farms are a public health menace. Uh, it can be thought of kind of a viral incubators for disease, a potential recipe for disaster. And so I guess, an obvious question people might be wondering is if we've known about this so long, why aren't our governments and institutions and powers that be actually doing anything about it? Well, look, the public health community has been shouting from the rooftops for decades. For example, the American Public Health Association, the largest group of public health professionals in the world, the oldest and largest group, has called for a moratorium on factory farms for nearly 20 years now. They just came out last year, 2019, reiterating the fact no more factory farms, no exp expansion of factory farms. And it's because of the public health implications, not just in these communities, but because of the risk of pandemic influenza. In fact, they published an editorial um, in uh, Journal of the American Public Health Association where they called not just for the de-intensification of the pig um, and uh, chicken industries, but actually question the need to raise so many animals in the first place. Um, uh, and uh, and, and uh, questioning whether we should be eating animals at all. And thankfully, due to you know, innovations in the food industry, that may not just be such a pie in the sky idea anymore. I mean, all you have to do is go to the local supermarket and look at the dairy case to see how much things have changed, right? Well, there's major dairies here in the state that are declaring bankruptcy. You don't have to worry about contaminated cattle brains in your oat milk, right? Plant-based milks, are a no-brainer. <clears throat> you could simply provide the public with better alternatives and let the market eliminate the risk entirely. And thankfully, um, there's expanded op options being started in the meat case as well. In fact, major um, uh, meat companies themselves, Tyson, Purdue, Smithfield, the largest pork producer in the world, just introduced an entire new line of plant-based options, right? Now, are these the healthiest um, uh, um, foods in the world? No, but pandemic risk, zero. <laughs> right, yeah, and I think I saw a, a, another statistic that UBS said, the bank, they predicted that plant-based meat sales could grow over to $85 billion a year very, very soon, which supports your point. But I guess the value of this industry still pales in comparison to the value of the animal agriculture industry. And it's from this point I wanted to ask you, um, are you worried that you're going against such huge industries? I mean, the animal agriculture industry is bigger than the oil industry. There's been wars over oil. Are you worried about <laughs> your own personal safety? 
worried about ending up in a ditch somewhere in Texas. Um, uh, you know, actually, you know, when I talk, you know, when I used to, I mean, I used to go on speaking tours talking about this issue and I'd be speaking at uh, poultry science departments, the grad, talking to grad students involved in the poultry industry and they realize the issues, but there's the epi economics. I mean, we could be breeding chickens um, with increased disease resistance, but unfortunately that impairs um, uh, their ability for, for efficient feed conversion in terms of maximum breast mass for broiler chicks and maximum egg production for egg laying hens. Right, and they seem to be putting the economics of animal farming before public health concerns. And I guess the way to get around this, as you say, is to build up the plant-based meat industries so that eventually they'll replace the meat and dairy industries. You know, it's no longer, these meat alternatives are no longer, uh, you know, some kind of niche market for vegetarians, right? These massive meat industry um, giants are going at with the consumer that needs to change, right? We don't need another veggie burger for vegetarians. They're already not contributing to pandemic risk. What we need is a burger that someone, you know, an option at, you know, Burger King for someone who loves burgers, but just wants to try something a little healthier for themselves. And it's also just happens to be healthier for the planet for both a global warming standpoint and a pandemic risk standpoint. Mm, right. And one thing I did want to ask you is about the Oprah Winfrey situation a few years ago, where she was sued for telling the truth about factory farms. Um, and it shows that basically the industry don't want to change the intensification, but they just want to cover up the truth by things like, you know, ag gag laws, which criminalize people for posting the horrors of factory farming. The only way the industry is a way able to keep doing what it's doing is by keeping the public in the dark. Um, and so that's what all Oprah did was just expose what was happening, um, standard industry practices. Um, but uh, thankfully, the lawsuit was won, it took eight years, um, but uh, the lawsuit was eventually won um, on First Amendment grounds. She should be able to say whatever she wants, um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but it's nice to, but I mean, there's nothing that she said that, uh, that uh, wasn't perfectly truthful. And in terms of the hallmark of meat recall, 150 million pounds of beef, this was, uh, if you remember the, the, the footage of them forklifting cows, these so-called spent dairy cows, people don't understand that dairy industry is a slaughter industry. I mean, they don't just, uh, Bessie doesn't just go out to pasture when her milk production declines. Um, uh, she gets turned into cheap hamburger. Um, and, uh, and, and, but the, the risk of, uh, uh, and, and because they're genetically bred to produce so many tens of thousands of uh, pounds of milk a year, um, their bodies uh, deteriorate very rapidly and they can become sick, they can become down, um, but it's illegal to uh, s slaughter a dead animal for the food supply. They have to be live at the slaughterhouse. So how do you do that? Well, then you have to drag these animals by chain, by forklifts, onto trucks, get them to the slaughter plant, drag them into the slaughter plant. And you know, for years, um, animal advocates were trying to get this, uh, this stopped, but to no avail, because no one cared about the welfare of animals. But along comes bovine spongiform encephalopathy, so-called mad cow disease, where one of the symptoms of mad cow disease is that there's so, that there's so much brain damage that the cows actually um, are unable to walk and fall down. And so maybe they're down because of a broken leg, maybe they're down because they have a transmissible brain disease. And so that's why finally, um, this, this uh, process of, of, of uh, dragging downed animals to slaughter was banned in the United States, not because of any concerns about animal cruelty, but because of the public health concerns. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at your Wikipedia page, which says, in 1998, you appeared as an expert witness testifying about the bovine spongy form encephalopathy, which is the disease you just um, mentioned in relation to when cattle uh, producers unsuccessfully sued Oprah Winfrey. I'm sure it's news to a lot of people that you've had such an influential background in this topic because people might just know the lifestyle medicine work you do at Nutrition Facts. So anyway, just to be really, really clear to get back to the topic, you're basically saying if people ate a plant-based diet, this would mean there'll be no pandemics? If people stopped eating animals in mass, we would dramatically reduce our risk of the emergence of killer pandemic viruses like the flu. You think COVID-19 is bad. This is just a dress rehearsal for a really killer plague like 
uh, in influenza with more than just a few percent um, case fatality rate could basically uh, change civilization as we know it. As bad as COVID-19 is, there's still food being restocked in the shelves. Doctors are still going to work. The internet may be slow, but at least it's still on. The electricity is still on. We have safe drinking water. That all goes down if we have um, a pandemic with a significant mortality. Uh, 1918 was 2%. It could be 30%, 40%. H7N9 is currently at 40%. H5N1 is currently at 50%. Flip of a coin mortality. Only about 1,500 people have died yet, but it hasn't yet locked in the mutation to spread human to human. How do we stop these viruses? We need to stop them. We need to stop them. to spread human to human. How do we stop these viruses? We stop giving these viruses billions of feathered and curly-tailed test tubes to brew up the next killer plague. How do we prevent these plagues in the future? We move away from eating animals and raising these animals. The reason we have 45 billion chickens on this planet is because we just bred them to be 45 billion new viral hosts. We can, we can, we can rob these pandemic viruses of these intermediate hosts that allow these viruses to jump to human beings by eating a more plant-based diet. Mm. And it's not just about pandemic risk though. This is something I want to talk about. It's also about if you get COVID-19 and you get one of these viruses, then how do we make sure our immune system is boosted? And can we do this? We can do this with a plant-based diet, right? A plant-based diet offers protection against COVID-19 because we have so much lower rates of the pre-existing conditions that increase your risk. Hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, um, obesity, uh, heart disease, type 2 diabetes. These are diseases that are, are dramatically lower among those eating healthy, whole food, plant-based diet. And how does this fit into the narrative about vitamin C and coronavirus? There's lots of stuff in the news about this. Is there data showing that vitamin C supplementation can help? There is no convincing data that taking megadoses of vitamin C is going to help with this pandemic. Hmm. Vitamin C is, is obviously really, really important, but you're saying that it's reductionist to rely on it from supplementation. Um, if you want good results, then you should have a balanced diet, which will provide you with enough vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C is critical to a functioning immune system. Um, but uh, only those who are deficient in vitamin C actually get a boost in their immune function from taking vitamin C and the same thing with zinc. So for example, uh, uh, zinc uh, can, um, uh, can half the odds of death in children with pneumonia, regular pneumonia, uh, but these studies were done in the developing world where presumably they have micronutrient deficiencies in the first place. It's not clear that taking zinc or vitamin C for people um, in higher income countries who presumably should be getting enough of these nutrients um, will uh, get a benefit from uh, taking supplements. Are you worried that quacks may spread dangerous kind of health advice during this coronavirus pandemic to people that are clearly desperate, they've got a lot of time, they're watching the news, they're reading articles. Um, what are the biggest sources of, of misinformation that you've seen about the coronavirus? There is this uh, people are jumping on this spammy bandwagon of, you know, supplements to boost your immune system kind of thing. This is uh, no surprise. I mean, we've seen this um, every pandemic going back a century um, where there are these vultures lining up to take advantage to exploit people's fears. Unfortunately, one of the primary sources of misinformation in the United States um, is coming straight from the top. Um, uh, you know, touting unproven remedies um, like these new malaria drugs, which uh, led um, uh, 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 one poor sap to actually um, kill themselves, uh, taking some aquarium cleaner that happened to have this chloroquine drug in it. Um, I mean, so I mean, it's critical at this time that common sense advice to keeping healthy, and that means eating a diet centered around whole plant foods, getting sufficient sleep, stress management, staying uh, connected, albeit remotely from friends and family, um, uh, and, uh, and exercise. These are kind of the foundations of basic immunity. That's what we should be pushing, um, as well as concentrating on, on, uh, on overcoming COVID-19 through social distancing, staying safe, staying at home, as well as preparing um, and, uh, for the next pandemic. Um, by changing the way we treat 
and eat animals. I just want to ask a question that I was going to ask at the beginning. How did he get into nutrition from infectious disease, which you've obviously got a background in? The first decade of my professional life was not talking about chronic disease, not talking about lifestyle disease, but talking about emerging infectious diseases. I would travel around the country um, giving grand rounds at hospitals, not talking about uh, you know, type two diabetes, uh, but talking about uh, you know, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or talking about avian influenza. Um, and uh, I wrote a, you know, people think that How Not to Die is my first book. It's actually my fourth book, and the, die before, and the book before that was on pandemic prevention and preparedness, where I had uh, my, a family pandemic uh, 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 preparation checklist. It's kind of like the daily dozen for pandemic prep, where I go through, this is the food, this is the, you know, this is the, you have the masks and the, and the, and the, the hand sanitizer. Um, and the disposable gloves and the toilet paper, you know, it was all in this, you know, but anyway, so that was kind of the daily dozen before it was the daily dozen. Um, but the world was just not ready to listen. Um, and kind of dismiss these concerns out of hand. There were these outbreaks, for example, SARS in 2002, um, uh, the, uh, the first deadly coronavirus outbreak, um, had about 10% of mortality, 10% of the people that got it, but about only about 8,000 people got it. So about 800 people died. We were able to squash that disease. But then we realized, wait a second, not just flu viruses, but coronaviruses could cause deadly outbreaks. Then 2012 with MERS, um, uh, the Middle East um, uh, Respiratory Syndrome, had about a 30% uh, mortality rate, killing about a third um, of the people. Again, another deadly coronavirus. And this actually... Uh, because of the way we're um, uh, treating farming camels um, in the Middle East. Um, and so we could see the writing on the wall. All of a sudden, there's this emergence of this of a flu virus. We thought the deadliest flu was in 1918, 2% um, uh, risk of dying. Now, all of a sudden, H5N1, 50, 60% risk of dying um, from the flu. And so you could see the threat looming on the horizon of these new deadly coronaviruses, these new deadly influenza viruses. And I was trying to kind of shout it from the rooftops and no one was ready to listen. And so then I really uh, switched course. I was like, all right, I want to save lives. They're not ready to think about pandemic prevention. So what's next on the list? What's killing the most people on the planet today? And what it was are these chronic diseases. Heart disease uh, was the number one killer. Um, uh, in, uh, in most industrialized countries. And then cancer um, and type two diabetes and the obesity epidemic. I was like, all right, until people are ready to hear um, about pandemics and, and, uh, and I was afraid it would take a pandemic um, for people to uh, finally um, open up to the threat. I was like, all right, in the meantime, let's save lives from our disease. Let's save lives um, from diabetes. And so then I switched over to chronic disease um, and uh, started in nutritionfacts.org um, in 2011. So that's what I've been doing for kind of this second decade of my professional life. Uh, but always knowing, waiting in the back of my mind that eventually I would be able to use all that expertise. I mean, I felt, um, I mean, at first I was really disappointed that you know, no one was listening, but I was like, you know, I will use this one day. I will use all this, this, this knowledge that I've gained to help people in the future and the future is finally here. And you must be planning to get back to lifestyle medicine at some point. Absolutely, I'm still gonna um, do, you know, How Not to Age, the next longevity book. I've got lots of time at home. My, my uh, How Not to Diet speaking tour canceled after just about 40 cities out of my 200 city tour. I was gonna um, get to the UK. Um, in fact, this month, I was gonna do my European tour. Um, uh, but uh, so now I've got lots of time. Um, but uh, first, we're going to do uh, um, uh, at least a month-long series of videos on COVID-19 talking about these issues on Nutrition Facts now that I have this platform to, uh, to get out into the world. Um, and so until, uh, until this pandemic has passed, it's kind of all hands on deck at Nutrition Facts to get this information out there, to cut through all the, the, the noise and nonsense out there, put out the best signs. We have this whole research team that's been geared up, ready for something like this. Now we're gonna put it to work. 
We're going to help people. I just gave a four hour webinar, supposed to be two hours. There's so much science. Four hour webinars, about 200 papers and preprints published every single day um, on this disease. Um, and so wouldn't it be great if there was someone just sitting there reading all those papers and getting the important groundbreaking bits out to people? That's what nutritionfacts.org was, uh, was, was, was made for. But instead of doing it for the latest on obesity, we're going to do it for the latest on this pandemic threat um, in hopes that uh, we can save people from both infectious diseases, chronic diseases, and ironically, um, actually both diseases uh, can, be, can be confronted as well as uh, really the third crisis facing humanity, um, climate change, with remarkably similar diets, a diet centered around healthy whole plant foods. I want to, we're coming to the end now, I want to ask a quick question um, about this coronavirus pandemic situation. Do you think there are any good situations coming from it at all? Well, you know, if there's ever a kind of silver lining to COVID-19 is that I think it'll get people to think about some of these broader issues. You know, it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, one of the risk factors for um, a severe course of COVID-19 is air pollution, areas where there was air pollution. Um, as well as the history of smoking, obviously puts you at risk for respiratory pathogens. But ironically, the air quality improved so much in China that the number of people dying prematurely actually uh, go, went down. So we're talking um, uh, as many as a thousand lives saved every single day due to the drop in air pollution. So actually, COVID-19 virus is saving lives. Right, and it's happening in other parts of the world also. And it's an opportunity, I guess, to, to see what needs to happen if we want to save the environment. Seeing all of a sudden the, the skies clear in India, um, you know, maybe give people a glimpse to the future and maybe rally everyone together um, across boundaries, across countries and say, look, we as a human species have a common goal to protect ourselves, to protect this planet, um, and hopefully we'll get us starting to think more long-term trillions of dollars gone, um, you know, billions on, in lockdown, millions potentially could die. If there was anything to just kind of wake humanity up to looking, you know, what kind of life are we giving to our children, our grandchildren? Hopefully this is the kick of pan, in the pants we need. Um, and those of us who've been working hard trying to get people um, to eat healthier, to treat themselves and the planet better, um, are, are, are optimally poised to give humanity an alternate vision on how good the future could be. These are times unlike any other in history. Right now, we are facing a global pandemic that is impacting all of our lives. And here's something you might not know that's really kind of important. Some of the biggest COVID-19 risk factors are obesity, heart disease, asthma, and other chronic illness. So if you are concerned about getting this virus and about what might happen if you do, then right now is a great time to start making every health promoting choice that you can. This is a great time to lose excess pounds and to clean up your diet and your lifestyle so you can optimize your health. Whether or not you ever get COVID-19, the health promoting choices that you make today will support you for the rest of your life. I'm Ocean Robbins, host of the Food Revolution Summit, and I'm on a mission. I want you to know the truth about your food so you can make the choices that will give you the health and the empowerment and the hope that you deserve in this time and in all time. That's why my dad and colleague, two million copy best-selling author John Robbins and I have teamed up with dozens of food experts to create the annual Food Revolution Summit. And because this information is so important, now more than ever, we are offering it to you completely for free. All you need to do is to enter your name and email on this page to reserve your spot right now. In this Food Revolution Summit, you're going to find out what's really going on behind the scenes in our food system. You'll find out which foods you need to avoid if you want to be healthy and what the leading edge of medical science is discovering about how you can optimize your immune health, how you can prevent and reverse illnesses like cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's and asthma and type 2 diabetes. And you will discover how you can really thrive with a healthy immune system, a healthy brain, 
and a healthy heart so you can enjoy the vitality, the energy, and the circulation you need to love your life. Most importantly, you'll find hope for your future and real, actionable, scientifically grounded solutions that you can use to improve your life and your community starting today. I can't wait to share it all with you. And remember, it's completely free. So go ahead and sign up right on this page. All you need to do is enter your name and email to reserve your spot right now. And I'll see you in the summit.